We have a variety of instruments here for measuring this. Not necessarily all of them are for liquids. We do have a device that will measure this for solid materials. Cross-linked um, materials are very commonly applied in this type of thing. You have a three-point bin. The sample will be clamped on either end, and the middle part will oscillate up and down. You can also do a cantilever where you can't clamp it on one end, still moving the end up and down. Or you can even do it in compression where you just put your sample right in the middle and you will oscillate it up and down like that. For more liquid-like materials, and again, the solid and liquid characterizations are in, in quotations because we know that those aren't exact uh, descriptions anymore. We have an os uh, a device that puts an oscillatory shear <coughs> and makes the measurements. All these instruments are computerized, so you can program them for a, a wide range of uh, pre preset uh, temperatures and strains and strain rates and such as you would expect. So here's an example of uh, what you can do with the DMA data. Customer called us up, said this actually happened last month. They wanted to know what the, uh, what the material looked like at 195 degrees C. So I went into the lab, measured it between 175 and 100, or 225 degrees at 10 degree intervals. I didn't do this just because I wanted to add the bill. Mm -hmm. Actually did this because, as you'll see here, the uh, customer gets far more valuable information by looking at it at a range of temperatures rather than just the one temperature that they, that they want. The reason this uh, uh, I did this is because most equipment is limited to three or four orders of magnitude for stress rate. Yeah, you can see here the, uh, the uh, shear rate that was applied was between 0.1 hertz and all the way up to 10 hertz. So we only got two, two orders of magnitude out of this. We can go a little bit lower, particularly on the, slow, on the low end, but that takes longer because if you're putting an oscillation on, you have to go at the inverse of it. So then to go to 0.02, that means it takes over 100 seconds for each single measurement. It's <coughs> quite long. And it's also not necessary to see. So with, the, the, with dynamic mechanical analysis, you can use this mathematical manipulation, which allows you in some cases to expand the range of, of data that you have to, in some cases, include 12 or more decades of shear rates. This is done with the technique known, time, known as time temperature superposition. This technique takes advantage of uh, observation of which uh, you should all be aware. You know that polymers are stiff at low temperatures. Most things are stiffer at lower temperatures than they are at higher temperatures. But we also know, based on what we've seen, uh, what's been discussed here so far with regards to stress rate, that at high stress rates, polymers will also be stiff. The converse is true with regards to high temperatures and low stress rates. Polymers have seen very similar at that. Technique is actually a mathematical way of converting one of those into the other, to say that high temperatures can be equal to certain low shear rates and vice versa. I'm giving you a hand-waving argument. There's a lot of math behind it, which I'm not going to get into. But uh, the technique has, has been well validated. It's been used for over 70 years. So uh, we're just going to go with it at this point. So you take the data that we had earlier. And what you do now is you'll take each of the individual curves and you start sliding horizontally on the graph until you, they start overlapping. And you'll see with that then you can expand the data into different shear rates than what you actually measured. With. The result then is a master curve which covers a much larger frequency. I'll give you exact, specific examples here. Again, this is the same data you saw before, 10 degree interval between 175 and 225. Client was interested in data at 195 degrees. So what we did now is we take the curve at 185 degrees and shifted it to the right until it overlapped. And so you can see now here, we're actually starting to expand the data out past our original measurement point. Next, we're going to take the, the curve for 175 degrees see at the top and do the same thing. Again, you've got even further now. You've almost acquired uh, nearly a whole, uh, whole decade of additional shear data. Now the lower temperature data, we're going to do the opposite. We're going to have to shift that to the left, as you see. So that the first one we'll do is, is shift the temperature, the 205 degree C data to the left, from the 215 degree C data, and lastly, the 225 degree C data. I'll have some examples of this uh, back in, in the rheology lab when we uh, take tours around labs, uh, previously recorded data up on, on, the, uh, on the computer screen. I'll let you shift the data around so you can see how it all works. 
This was all done as G prime at the same time. Once you have these shift factors, G, G double prime has the same shift factors. And then knowing this, you can go back and compute the viscosity. And so this is what you end up with as a final product. And this is again, all at 195 degrees C, even though the data wasn't all taken at 195 degrees C. We ended up getting a much, much larger data range for the client. This is an idealized curve. This is kind of one of those things that you see for very, very limited sets of polymers. Basically, in order to see this, you need uh, a polymer that has a very large operating range, meaning has a very low PG or a very low softening point, it has a very high operating point on the other end. It also shows a big temperature sensitivity going between those two extremes. Usually you only see this with uh, with certain ISO, um, or excuse me, with certain acrylates, like ISO octoacrylate or 2 ethyl hexyl acrylate. Those, those are the materials that uh, 3M and other companies make pressure sensitive acrylated pieces out of. You will also see this occasionally with polyisobutylene that they were filled. But those are about the only two polymers where you can get a very large temperature range to work with and still have big temperature sensitivities between the two. Silicone has a very large uh, temperature range associated with it, but it's pretty insensitive to temperature. So you really have to, to uh, you don't get that much shift out of each uh, different, uh, as you go, as you're stepping off at like say 10, 20 degree intervals, you don't see that much difference between one curve and the other. So when you start doing your time temperature superposition, your sliding, you don't gain a whole lot for each, each temperature interval that you need. So, in any case, uh, all polymers will, will show you at least some segment of this, depending on what temperature range it is that you looked at. And this is where it actually can get, get kind of interesting. If you, um, let's go back. the viscosity curve that you see here um, starts out on the top on the left-hand side. It's pretty simple. You've got a uh, zero shear viscosity that's over here at very low shear rates and then you reach a point where it starts falling off of the power law. That's about it. That's about all the more you can get for shear viscosity. There isn't a whole lot you can read into that. But with this now, suddenly you have two different curves and they're all showing different peaks and plateaus and all kinds of stuff. There's a huge amount of information now that you can start to gather out of this that you can't gather out of just a viscosity curve. Three uh, major portions of it, the terminal zone is on the far left. You'll notice that's where G double prime, the liquid component, is actually higher than the solid component. That's because you're at very low stress rates, time, the material has lots of time to relax, it's able to relax and it appears like a fluid. As you get to higher and higher temperatures or higher and higher shear rates, the uh, uh, G double or G prime starts taking over and dominating the materials to be, appears to be solid. And actually when we get into a plateau like that, it actually appears to be rubber. And then finally, you end at, at high enough steer, straight, uh, shear rates or strain rates, you get to the point where uh, where the material starts to and collapsing. It just doesn't have time at all to relax. You're hitting it so hard, so fast that uh, that it doesn't relax. 